This story is about one man and one ship, an Essex-class aircraft carrier called the USS Bunker Hill. But while in support of the evasion off the coast of Okinawa, all the men could do on all of the other ships was just stare up and watch this lone target zero in on its kill. And then a second one. Well, after the kamikazes hit with their 550-pound bombs, there was quite a fire. The bombs penetrated the flight deck and even exploded in the pilot's ready room. There were several explosions, and it was horrific. Bunker Hill lost a total of 390 sailors and airmen, including 43 missing, guys that were never found. 264 men were wounded. But what was probably the worst part of the ordeal was that the air intake vents were left on and all of the smoke, all of the toxic fumes were sucked in to all of the lower decks. Many of these men were doomed. But let's rewind back to 1934. We're at the Naval Academy and there were a bunch of overachievers, including this guy. His name was Frank Whitaker. And after graduating, he would start his training with the torpedo bombers, the TBD devastators at the time, and he'd work his way up to become this guy, Lieutenant Commander Frank Whitaker from the USS Bunker Hill. While Frank was now leading the first division on the USS Bunker Hill of torpedo bombers, and that was the spanking new TBF Avenger. And he was an innovator. Well, just one example of his energy and prowess was told by Tom Blackburn. Tom was the skipper of VF-17, and he said, this Lieutenant Whitaker, uh, he would beg, borrow, he would even sneak around and steal airborne radar systems wherever he could, and he'd tinker with them, and he would develop these foul weather and night attack techniques. And after a while, they caught on, and guess what? They were... They actually, in the end, won fleet-wide acceptance by the time uh, in early 1944, and everybody was using it, so he he was a go-getter. This guy had panache. I mean, he named his air group division Hobo One, and they named the aircraft carrier their group Hobo Town. And when they went out flying around, they called their air group Boxcar, another air group Caboose, Hobo One, they'd all rendezvous. The rendezvous would be the roundhouse. And uh, when they said the words chow down, that meant enemy dinners ready would be target as sighted. So he had a lot of color. But sadly, less than a year later, Frank was to go on his last mission. And he took along a famous journalist, a UP correspondent named Raymond Clapper. And together they were maneuvering over the Inuitak Atoll in the Battle of the Marshall Islands. Unfortunately, Frank collided with his wingman. Both planes went down and there were no survivors. This is an image of my TBM Avenger, which is still ironically lost in the White Mountains of Arizona. Somewhere in those hills, those mountains, this TBM is laying there. And it still commemorates Frank and Hobo One and the Wolfgang Squadron, all the other men, names like Al Turnbull, Dick Walsh, Harry Jones, Stanley Knight, all of those guys that bravely fought She still lays there lost, lost in the mountains. This airplane is part of our heritage, our history, and we're going to find her this spring. We've got a strategic plan, and we're going to talk about that next. But first, let's look at some videos of some of the flights that we took just before this happened. We made a lot of progress here. We still need to put in. There's the big transmitter. There back there is what else we got some 50 caliber rounds feeding down into this box. This is the radar and this is the radar control. 
tail gunner who was up here. We did uh, fly yesterday and test the wing machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns. They work great. Here's a These are the White Mountains of Eastern Arizona, and somewhere in these peaks or valleys, our TBM is hidden. It's probably hidden under many feet of snow right now, but in spring, when the snow melts, we're gonna be surveying from the air. Unfortunately, with just bare eyes, you can't see to the forest floor, but we're gonna be using a new technology to see through. But for now, the location of this lonely, straggling parachute is all that remains. We are going to use a new technology called Light Detection and Ranging, LIDAR. And basically, the airplane flies a grid pattern and shoots a whole bunch of light beams it's kind of like radar or sonar and the light beams come back and they report back and the light beams that we'll analyze are the light beams that penetrate the leaves and the branches that hit the forest floor. And when you just look at those light beams, it's like erasing the forest and looking at the bare earth. Here's an example transitional image from the same area and here you can see the bare forest floor. And let's pick out an anomaly here, and let's zoom in on this. It looks like something, but we don't know what it is. Let's put the forest floor back in. Look, you would never know it's even there, but erase the forest. There it is, something. Again, forest, bare earth. So we believe this is the way we're gonna find the airplane. It's gonna be sitting there, maybe in pieces, but it's probable that most anomalies will show up Here's a view of the actual area where we're going to be looking, and here you can see the triangular grid pattern. Purple line represents the last flight path, and we think the plane was banking to the right. So taking that search pattern all the way to the east to the reservation border, there's a good chance we're going to get some hits. 